I denne podcasten snakker vi med de fremste virksomheten i Norge på teknologi, digitalisering og transformation. Vad skal til for å lykkes, og hvordan går man frem? Du lytter til Teknologi og mennesker, en podcast av Atea og Oslo Business Forum. Hi, welcome to the show. Before we get started, you will hear a short intro in Norwegian. After that, the entire episode this time is in English. Nu er vi endelig i gang med en ny podcast-sesong. Første episode i denne sesongen er en aldrig så liten gavepakke. Vi har tatt en prat med verdens fremste fremtidsforsker, Amy Webb. Hun og hennes team står bak den anerkjente, uavhengige trendrapporten Future Today Institute Trend Report. Den kommer ut hvert år og lanseres på verdens største tech-konferanse South by Southwest. Vi møtte henne på Oslo Business Forum forrige uke. Nå kan du kose dig med ukens episode. Welcome to the show, Amy Webb. Um, this show is famous. Thank you for show, having me. I yeah, can't believe I'm is, here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, uh, and actually it's a pleasure to have you here because I'm one of your fans. That's uh, actually, sweet. thank you. I've seen you a couple of times in Austin's on South by Southwest mm-hmm. and now on stage at uh, Oslo Business Forum. So I love it. Thank you. Usually when we do this podcast, uh, we have an editorial team that puts together the topics and the questions, uh, but this time, uh, we're doing it a bit differently. So we asked our listeners, to, what do you want to know? Yeah, that's um, awesome. Yeah, I, can't, so I can't wait to know what everybody wants to know. The list is long. Okay. I picked out <laughs> 10 questions. So okay. hope, hopefully we can get through that. Uh, but first of all, uh, what is a futurist? Good question. So a futurist is somebody that uses data and builds models to see plausible, possible, and preferred futures. And the point of this work is to explore what might be next, but ultimately to make decisions. Mm. So the thing that I think people don't get, don't understand about futurists is we don't predict the future. Uh, It's not really our jobs. Uh, Our job is more about preparation than prediction. Yeah, because we we keep talking about uh, Amy Webb's predictions, but that's wrong. Well, I mean, look, it is also a prediction. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, So, but... uh, But the goal of this work isn't for me to come back and say I was right, which, by the way, I am almost always right. But that's not the goal. Uh, The the (laughs) goal is to reduce uncertainty so people can make decisions. Hmm. So I would focus less on the predictions or the trends and more on, okay, well, what does this mean for me? And what are the choices that we're going to make now? Hmm. Yeah. Um, The first question from the audience. Uh, How do you define? differentiates between trends that will have a lasting impact and those that are uh, just a fad? Yeah, great question. What's the difference between trend and trendy? So you mentioned South by Southwest. Mm. I don't know how long you've been going, but I feel like this would have been 2013 or 2012. Were were you there Uh, a decade ago? Yeah, Some of of your listeners might have been. Yeah. So I just remember that year there was uh, these brand new social networks called Foursquare. Hmm. And um, there was another one called Gowalla and another one called Scavenger. And basically, if you, got, if you went to a place, you would sort of check in. So you would say, I'm, I'm here. I actually use Swarm. Swarm, yeah, 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 totally, totally. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So, so you get it. Yeah. You would get a badge and it was cool. And also like a little bit of a security risk, but personal security risk. So... Um, I remember telling people these badges, these swarm, like this is not the trend. The long term, this is trendy. Hmm. The long term trend is boring. It's location based networks and connections. Hmm. But nobody cared about that. So what's the difference? Um, is, Is what you're seeing related to a fundamental basic human need? So um, the answer is yes or no. But, you know, is it related to that? Is it timely, but will it persist over time? Meaning, is whatever this thing is going to continue to provide value going forward? Does it represent some time, some type of fundamental change in behavior? Mm. Um, and then, can it be, you know, replicated over time? So there are these different qualities that we look for, and it's it can be really hard because sometimes there's so much hype that it just feels like, so like right now, generative AI, that's the trend, right? My answer is absolutely not. Um, Generative AI is an example of assistive computing. That's the trend. Hmm. You'll notice the word AI or the the letter, it's not in there, right? Um, So 
after generative AI chatbots, there'll be the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. But the real trend is assistive computing. So that's what I would say. Yeah. Next one. We have 10, I'll make my answer shorter. I know we only yeah. have, we've got yeah. 10, so sorry. <laughs> yeah. uh, this is funny. Uh, what is the most surprising prediction, I don't know, yeah, yeah, you, yeah. 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 Uh, you ever made that came true? Um, so, interestingly enough, I, don't, I mean, I, I don't know if this is the most surprising, but it's current. So I, I, we, my company publishes a newsletter. Somebody forwarded me a message that I, I wrote in 2018 that described exactly how people are using generative AI today hmm. and some of the deep fakes that we start, like there was a, at this conference, people showed a deep fake of Tom Cruise, which I'm sure your listeners know all about. So I was about five, six years ahead of, of what's happening now. And the email that I got was nice. It was like, hey, you were right. And I knew about this before everybody else. Um, but again, it's not about being absolutely right about everything, because it's about being prepared. Hmm. So like, okay, this is a possibility. Then what do we need to do today? Good. Uh the tech trend report you make every year, uh, and now it's like six months since the last one. Yep, uh, approximately. Uh, it's solid. It's uh, it's massive. It's, it's like it's too much. Let's be honest. Yeah. <laughs> We're producing too much content. I know it's kind of hard to read, but yeah. So I I, I can't say I read it all, but yeah, I, I there's no yeah, yeah, it's a lot. So, but this question is quite good. When you look back, is there anything you regret putting into the report? Yes. Or predictions that haven't come true or something? Um, so what I would, we always get the, the things right. So the trends have always been right. The timing is what's hard. Yeah. So how do you figure out what's the momentum, what's the trajectory? So we, we have a model that has, uh, we can calculate it. Sometimes we get the calculation wrong. And years ago, we thought that, this is super techy, but near field, NFC, near yeah. field communication, um, we thought was going to be like in the next phones that everybody was making. We also thought 12 years ago that QR codes were going to be everywhere. And we got the timing totally wrong on both. Um, and it really took COVID for QR codes to yeah, be massive, ubiquitous, right? Anyway, yeah. So that, but that's really, that's a good example of why this can be really challenging to do. Because cause getting the timing right is, is, is more science than art. Hmm. I love QR codes. I love QR yeah. codes too. Uh, yeah. Can I tell you a really, I'll, I'll yeah, make yeah, it yeah, super yeah, short. Yeah, yeah, no. So my husband is somewhere with me. He's over there. Yeah. And um, for Valentine's Day in 20, we were still living downtown. I bet you it was, I bet you it was 2007. Um, I was telling him QR codes are going to be everywhere next. And he was like, no, they're not. So for Valentine's Day, I said, let's take a walk. And we went outside and I was like, oh my God, on a light pole, look, there's a QR code. Then he was like, weird. And I said, why don't you scan it? And then he was like, what did you do? I made a scavenger hunt with QR codes all around the city. I had posted them everywhere. Oh, cool. And each QR code was a little clue to get to the next place. Wow. So we yeah. spent eight hours walking as he was figuring out where to go. And then at the end, I was feeling very good about myself. And at the end, I realized I actually forgot to get him a present. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you were so, disappointed, I so guess. So yeah. that was the end. The end yeah. was we wound up back at our house and he was like, what's the gift? And I was like, uh, it was spending <laughs> time together for the day. Yeah, and health benefits. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Uh, this one is uh, a bit tricky, but uh, in the Nordics, um, the hype around blockchain mm. has long since died down uh, in a way. People don't talk about it that much, yep. but um, the blockchain technology has developed significantly uh, and been adopted to several new industries now. Yeah. What's your take on blockchain? Why don't, why don't we talk about it anymore, or do we? I mean, honestly, because we all have short attention spans. Hmm. Look, I want to say, whatever, five years ago, everybody was talking about blockchain. Then four years ago, it was cryptocurrency. Then it was metaverse, yeah. right? And now it's AI. Um, there's plenty happening in blockchain, and especially in the Nordics, where your industries have to, there's a lot of industries here, but sh I think of shipping and banking. Mm. Um, there's a huge story that just came out this week in America, although I think it's a global story, 
some company that, that nobody can find was selling unregistered parts to airlines. So yeah, like parts for engines, right? Yeah. And they had fake certificates. Now I'm sure what happened was some manufacturer probably made these parts and they didn't pass an inspection and some other company was like, we'll buy them. Hmm. And then they faked the certificate and sold them for whatever, a little bit cheaper. Blockchain solves the problem of, hey, do we have fake parts in our airplanes? You can establish provenance. So I think in a place like the Nordics, where there's logistics and shipping and telecommunications, there's huge opportunity for blockchain. Um, and it's gonna be needed going forward. So I think there will be demand in the future. So, so don't give up on blockchain. No, we won't. <laughs> okay, good, good to hear that. Yeah. Um, in your presentations, uh, as I said earlier, I've listened to you uh, from, like in the audience from stage uh, a couple of times, but uh, one, I don't think you said it today, but uh, you often say the most uh, important question for businesses is what if. Right. What do you mean by that? Sure. Um, so there are lots of examples of smart executives asking, well, they, they hear about something new. And then they start asking, well, what if this happens? What if this, what if that? Asking the question, what if, is a way of rehearsing a different possible future. I would argue these are the two most important words in business because what they do is they open the mind to looking for outside signals and trends and thinking about how tomorrow might be different than today. Companies like Amazon is a good example of this. That executive leadership team Jeff Bezos is doing other things now on a boat, so, <laughs> which are very embarrassing when they get photographed, but he built a culture that I actually admire because the team asks what if a lot. Okay, what if, what if, what if? And they are they don't get a lot of credit for this, but they are building out the future in a way that's gonna be hard to challenge. But I see executives of very successful companies actually afraid to ask what if because even asking that question challenges the status quo. You have to be willing to challenge your thinking in the present and to challenge the status quo in the present, even just thinking about it, um, because you have to be open to the idea that the future hasn't been written yet, hmm. right? So, so super important. They only gave me 38 minutes, so I couldn't talk about everything today. No, uh, no. but it was inspiring though. <laughs> um, uh, this is um, kind of um, a follow-up question, yeah. I guess, um, because uh, upskilling um, the employees and stuff. Yep. Um, there's one question uh, about uh, how you, how will AI affect the workplace? Yeah, uh, and you talked about that earlier uh, today as well. But yeah. there's so many uh, confusing uh, thoughts about this. What's your take on this? There sure are. So. Actually, I just wrote and published a new piece in Harvard Business Review about this. A lot of what I'm seeing are executives and management teams and management consulting firms saying, here, you know, can we use AI to reduce part of our workforce? Um, labor is usually the most, uh, it's the most expensive part of running any business so that the less labor um, you can have while improving or keeping the same the output you know, the, the economics are better. But AI can't replace the things that humans do. So I know it feels like that right now. And there are certainly some instances where AI uh, makes more sense. However, going forward, we're gonna need a bunch of, AI is actually gonna result in us needing a lot more people in certain fields, not less. Mm. So the way to look at AI is, how do we improve our top line growth, not just our bottom line growth? So this seems like a contradiction, but companies, companies actually need to be upskilling everybody, everybody, whether that's human resources or you know, just everyday workers, because I see AI as an assistive tool, not a replacement tool. Um, but you have to build those competencies. You have to be able to understand what it can do, what can't it do, so that you're ready. And you don't like to call this like an AI revolution. You want I to don't. call it evolution. 
I feel well, like revolution, everybody's late to the party yeah. on this. There's no <laughs> revolution. No. It's an evolution. This mm. has been in development, you know, I would argue for hundreds of years. Um, the, coin, the term artificial intelligence was coined in 1956 at Dartmouth University over the summer. Um, some guys got together and had a workshop and they came up with this idea, but it actually wasn't their idea. They were just naming it. They were the ones who named it artificial intelligence. So we've just, we've, it's been a long horizon. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so it's not really a revolution, it's an evolution. And the major yeah. driving force here is the big tech companies. Is right that now, problematic? Yeah. Well, totally. Um, in fact, I was just talking to a super smart guy who, who was walking with me here. He's a, on his tag, I saw that he was from Roche Diagnostics and Marketing. I didn't catch his name. Mm. So if you're listening, you asked me a great question. He said, um, do we run the risk of just getting homogenous answers for everything? If you just have a couple of companies um, feeding into these systems, are we going to all get the same answers over and over again? And, and maybe the answers aren't wrong. Maybe they're right, but there's no variety. And the answer is, that's already happening. Because we have just a few tech companies building all of this, there's not a lot of... So that's part of it. They don't want to be embarrassed. So the, there's a problem in AI called hallucination, which is when AI spits out weird, nonsensical answers to things, like they're on drugs and they're hallucinating. <laughs> um, so they don't want that to happen because it's embarrassing and it makes shareholders nervous. So they always want the, the best possible answer out, which means you have to limit variability, which is my way of saying it's in the best economic interests of the big tech companies to give us fewer types of answers but make sure they're right than to give us, you know, what humans do, which is tons of different types of answers. I, I worry a lot about that going forward. And because we have just a few tech companies, basically in the U.S. and China, but like, that's not good for the Nordics. You have a totally different culture, different sensibilities. It's not good for anybody. Uh, what's your uh, advice to all the uh, listeners uh, mm -hmm. when it comes to applying AI technology to their work? Like, yeah. uh, how should they think? How can they get yeah. along with this? So it's a good question. The first thing that I would say is now is a good time to just experiment. Mm. Um, and if you're interested, if you're somebody who's willing to read research papers, then read research papers. But you have to keep in mind the thing that's trendy is chatbots. Mm. That's not the trend. So you, you have to sort of, while you're experimenting, start asking yourself, what if? What if we have text to video, which is coming, I, like in a couple of weeks? Um, what if we have text to robots, right? H how does the world start to look different? What does that mean? How does that change society? You have to kind of let your mind wander productively. That's the biggest piece of advice. I know everybody's like, which platform should I use? Or yeah. what code do I need to learn? You got to do some critical thinking. Like that's the most important thing right now. And I, I guess many people are like scared of being too slow that I get, miss something or is that? I would much rather that you're too slow and you miss something yeah. than you're too fast mm -hmm. and you miss something because that's what's happening right now. Um, I see everybody moving so fast that they are not stopping to think about the risks. And I know every, it's very sexy to talk about risks. Everybody likes to talk about the end of humanity. Mm. <laughs> That's not yeah. practical, mm. right? So it's about having the sort of more boring, practical conversations. Your listeners, know they know all about tech. So like, I, like you're the right people. You're our people. You're my people. So like, have the, you guys should be having those conversations with each other. Definitely. Do you have a favorite AI tool? You um, talked about earlier about all the screenshots yeah, on your phone. Yeah. Uh, um, I mean, in terms of the biggest systems right now, Bard is pretty good. That's from Google, but it's slow. Um, Claude from Anthropic is also pretty good, also a little slow, also a little confusing. GPT-4 is very fast, but it freaks me out because I don't know. I just found out that my books 
are part of what trained that system. And it's not like they asked me permission first. Mm. So um, I'm pretty skeptical about all of these systems and that like Dolly, the image generators are full of bias. Mm. Um, I talked about a tool on stage, which this is like just for me personally. I just take all these screenshots all the time. Like even walking through this um, convention center, like I, I saw something really cool, took a picture and I'll, three days and I'll be like, oh yeah, I'm gonna come back <laughs> and so. think of it. And then three days from now, I'm gonna look at my phone and what, what the hell was I thinking? Why did I take a picture of this? Um, Cause you can't really search that type of information. So this tool that I found makes every picture that I take searchable and it will summarize what's in the picture. I mean, that's like a, for me, that's like a total game changer. So that's useful. Yeah, I, I'm gonna check that out actually, yeah. We have one last question. Okay. And this is about, uh, in general, we're consuming more. It's um, goods are becoming cheaper and cheaper, but there is a problem, climate change um, and stuff. What's your approach on how can technology uh, contribute to uh, a circular economy yep. uh, to get uh, the emissions down and stuff yeah. like that? What, what's your, what are your thoughts about that? Um, my thoughts are, Thank God somebody's asking that question because yeah, like <laughs> nobody's asking yeah. that question in the US. Yeah. Um, look, the Nordics have always been so far ahead. You're, I, I love, the, I would move here, except I can't deal with your winter time. It, no. it gets dark too early. Yeah. Um, I think that the values and the ideas and everything else here are great. Thinking about the implications on the environment are also great because the computing power required to do to use ChatGPT for one small thing, it takes way more energy and costs like seven times the amount that to just run a Google search. So this is where maybe we start to apply AI for good. Um, there's a weird inter intersection between AI and biology. And that area is called synthetic biology. So basically in computers, you have ones and zeros. In humans and other life forms, you have ATCG. That's what makes up DNA. Um, it's the difference between you, a human, and the mushroom that I had for dinner last night. So if we can edit things, that gives us optionality going forward. So a good example of this is cultured meat, um, so, or even cultured fish. Uh, you eat a lot of fish in Norway, uh, I also eat a lot of fish. The oceans are overfished. Um, what if we had a small bit of tissue, like two grams of a tuna, and instead of catching tunas, we could grow tuna meat inside of something called a bioreactor. I know it sounds like it sounds I'm not eating freaky, yeah. freaky <laughs> lab grown, whatever, but you, you can already do this with chicken. Hmm. And Singapore, the island nation, it's not like they have space for farms. Singapore is using this because right now they have to import all of their meat. They're taking warehouses in their city and office buildings and putting bioreactors inside to grow chicken that is the same as chicken that used it to have a- the same. And to, but molecularly, it's the same. Yeah. So this is not a GMO situation. Mm. Mm. It's better because there, this chicken has no antibiotics no extra hormones. It's just clean, good meat that's better for the animal. I mean, it's better for the environment. It's better for the chicken, because yeah. now we don't have to kill <laughs> yeah, a bunch yeah, of chickens. Yeah. It also means that Singapore's whole economy could change. Maybe the future of Singapore is, it's an agricultural center, and it's, it's exporting now to every other country in Southeast Asia. There are huge opportunities on the horizon. Mm. These also, you know, if we can tweak biology in this way, it's also risks. We could invent new viruses that are worse than coronavirus, right? Mm. COVID. So I would say, we, again, we got to ask what if. And we have to be willing to confront ourselves with challenging conversations so that we can get to the preferred future, which I think is possible. Thank you. Uh, Amy, is there any question that we should have asked? 
There, I mean, you and I could talk all yeah, day long. Yeah, yeah. So, like, I don't want to. I don't want to keep yeah. anybody. But no, I thought. Listen, these are the, you have obviously you have a great audience and you've got really smart. I love the audience. Yeah, yeah mm. they're awesome, and you've got mm. really smart people because they ask these great questions. So maybe my my last thing I might say is keep asking questions. That's a great way to plan for the future. Open up your mind, ask questions, and listen to awesome podcasts like this one. Thank you so much, Amy. Thank you. Du har nå lyttet til Teknologi og mennesker, laget av Atea og Oslo Business Forum. Liker du podcasten, setter vi stor pris på om de gir oss noen stjerner. Og tips gjerne en venn om podcasten. 